Well, in this deal of paleo news, there we're going to talk about three papers, and they all have one thing in common: it's talking about mammals. <clears throat> And of course, these were brought about by the grad by the graduate students, some of which have to do with um, you know, at least one of them has dealing with mammals in his um studies in paleontology. So it's not surprising, you know, they when they have these paleo um, news, you know, paleo journal clubs, they bring up at least one session where it's all mammals. These ones are relatively recent. There are just um first one to go to the okay, this is kind of silly in a way, and we all kind of thought so, but. <clears throat> The evolutionary origin of jaw yaw in mammals. Yeah, jaw yaw. You're gonna run that through your head in some musical fashion. Now you are. Uh, this is a paper by David M. Grossnickel. Uh, let's see, it was published. You know, it was published in March of 2017. <clears throat> Let me read the um, beginning part here. Uh, Theria comprises of all, all but three living mammalian genera and is one of the most ecologically pervasive clades on Earth. Yet, the origin of early history of Therians and their close relatives, i.e. Cladotherians, remains surprisingly enigmatic. A critical biological function that can be compared among early mammal groups is mastication. That's chewing your food. Morphometrics and modeling analysis of the jaws of Mesozoic mammals indicate that cladotherians evolved musculoskeletal ana um, anatomies that increased mechanical advantage um, during jaw rotation around the dorsal ventrally oriented axis, i.e. the yaw. You know, um, let's see, dorsal ventrally, and um, in other words, up and down motion. Um, while decreasing the mechanical advantages of jaw rotation around a medial laterally oriented axis, that's the pitch, these changes parallel molar transformations in early cladotherians and that indicate the chewing cycles, including significant transverse movement, likely produced via, via yaw rotation. Thus, I hypothesize that cladotherians' molar morphologies and musculoskeletal jaw anatomies evolve con concurrently with increased jaw rotation and a jaw during um, chewing cycles. The increased transverse movement resulting from yaw rotation may have been a crucial evolutionary prerequisite for the functional, functionally versatile tribosphenic molar morphology, of which underlies the molars of all therians and is retained by many extant clades. Okay, basically the whole point of this argument is that as you get to um, the type of mammals that includes us, eutherians, and marsupials. The type of tooth that they have, um, let's see, you have the, um, you know, um, you got your, you know, you have your basic cones, but then you have what you have, the talino, talonid shelf, and, the, and then later a wider version of that, the talonid basin. Basically, it's a part of the molars, uh, particularly the lower molars, that acts like a little cup for the upper cum, cusp of the of the upper molar tooth to come in and you know it helps grind think of it like a, a mortar and pestle now the argument here is that as um, mammals later uh, mammals um, that he's talking to cladotherium which includes marsupials and placentals like us um, which had this uh, type of tri of trivospheding um, tooth as the as when as they develop a jaw rotation, you know the jaw yaw as it you know, as it's going, and with the talonid shelf and then later the talonid basin, it they kind of went hand in hand together. That, you know, you could think of it as a means of with these two in common, you can you, you could exploit more food resources. So. I don't want to get too much into this, but it does go into the mechanics of the jaws, particularly um, jaw features, um, and then the tooth themselves. So I think it's not a bad idea. And it does mention, <coughs> if, I excuse me, if I recall, that um, other mammals have developed certain, um, you know, like they had certain mammals may have had the jaw rotation and such, but I think this is kind of a... Um, coherent um, when these two features both the jaw rotation mechanics and the type of tooth involved like the talonid shelf which is you know it's like a smaller version of the um, mortar and pestle effect than the talonid basin which is much wider but when those two finally came in hand the species that had those were able to exploit more resources so more um, more different types of food from plants to insects to even um, when they get bigger other small mammals 
So he goes for all this type of um, oh um, um, uh, discussions here, like results of discussion. You talk about the angular process shape, which is an extension of the corner of the of the jaw, you know, particularly off the angular bone. Uh, jaw joint corner process um, elevation. Um, the corner process is the um, let's see. We can take a look at the skull. There's plenty of illustrations. Um, okay, if this is the part where you see the teeth, but you got the huge bump before it continues your jaw. That part is the coronoid process. It's the, you can read it on there, and that's where the you know where the jaw connects to the skull. They do measurements of that, the pitch and roll, and once you start reading this, you get the idea of what he's talking about. It, it, again, it's you know it's not a bad study, um, very compelling argument. Just the jaw, y'all. I'm sorry, I can't really you know like jaw, y'all, y'all, y'all. Okay, I'm being silly, but you know you know you're gonna do that yourself, if not me. But anyway, that's the first one. You know, um, link it down below, of course. And the next one here, we're gonna talk about a new developmental mechanism for the separation of the mammalian middle ear ossicles from the jaw by um, Daniel J. Urban et al. Let's see. Um, Royal Society of Publishings. This was published back in January 2017. The abstract is multiple mammalian lineages independently evolve a definitive mammalian middle ear um, through breakdown of Meckel's cartilage. Um, however, the cellular and molecular drivers of this evolutionary transition remains unknown for most mammal groups. Here, we identify such drivers in the living marsupial opossum, Monodelphus domestica, whose um, Meckel cartilage transformation during development automatically mirrors the evolutionary transformations observed in fossils. Specifically, we link um, increases in cellular um, apoptosis and, um, and TGF-BR2 signaling uh, to Meckel's cartilage breakdowns in opossums. We demonstrate that a simple change in a TGF um, beta signaling is efficient um, to inhibit to inhibit Meckel's cartilage breakdown during opossum development, indicating that changes in TGF beta signaling might be key um, during mammalian evolution. Furthermore, the apoptosis that we observe during opossum's metal cartilage breakdown does not um, it does not seemingly occur in a mouse consistent with homoplastic um, you know, definitive mammalian middle ear evolution in the marsupials and placental lineages. So by comparing one um, um, uh, the opossum, which is a marsupial, and mice, which are placentals, um, they this is a, this is one of those studies. That, bear in mind is both um, paleontology and biology. This study usually has to do with the fact that um, they've taken um, this kind of gets gruesome. They've taken the young at certain levels of development. And, and of course, they had to euthanize them. Then they looked into how the Meckel's cartilage, which is part of the jaw, separates um, from the rest of it. Um, and then, for um, because through that detachment, you the bones that remain that detached from the jaw become inside your ear. Remember, you got you know got the three famous um, bones in your ear, and those are bones that are, while we use them from hearing now, they all developed from, you know, previously as parts of the jaw. And because, you know, right now we only have one jaw in the, hum in the humans as a dentary, but in earlier species it is about multiple bones. You have the dentary, the angular, serangular, and what have you. This is by comparing these two and seeing when they detach and they found out what gene that they can um, tr you know, activate, you know, decrease, you know, you know, inhibit or start it, and they can see where it happens. And it's slightly different for both the mice and marsupials. So it's a very, um, let's see, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, paper that you, they finally get. We can see this with modern extent species and embryological development, and it does correlate with the evolutionary. Um, pattern that we see in nature through fossils. So, again, I'll, you know, quickly going through this. I, can, I will admit, I will tell you right now, if you're a little bit squeamish on the methods of how they gain the information through the embryos, okay, you know, fair enough. Not everybody's um, used to that, but that's science for you. You know, we, you know, for us to understand 
we sometimes have to do this. If there's a better way, I'm sure they'll do it. Now the last one, I definitely found most interesting, from Nature Communications, uh, published in April, um, let's see, uh, published December 2016. A large carnivorous mammal from the late Cretaceous and the North American origin of marsupials. Marsupial mammal relatives, stem metatherians from the Mesozoic era to 252 to 66 million years ago, are mostly known from isolated teeth and fragmentary jaws. Here we report on the first near-complete skull remains of North American late Cretaceous metatherian, the stegodontid di um, didelphodon borax. Our phylogenetic analysis indicate that the marsupial, that marsupials of the closest relatives evolved in, uh, in North America as part of the late Cretaceous diversification of Mediterranean, and later dispersed in, um, to South, uh, South America. In addition to being the largest known Mesozoic um, Therian mammal, node-based clay of, of Eutherians and Mediterranean, the Delphodon vorex has a um, vast estimated bite force and other cranial, mandibular, and dental features that suggest that it, uh, it is the earliest known therian to invade the durophagous um, predator scavenger niche. Our results broaden the scopes of the eco-morphological diversification of Mesozoic mammals that include therian lineages that, in this case, uh, were linked to the origins of evolution of marsupials. Okay. Now, a lot of people, when you think uh, marsupials, if you know about them all, you're going to think Australia. So. With the exception of a uh, few mammal, uh, mammals in Asia, most of what we have found of early marsupials are from North America. And later on we find them, they dominated, um, they moved down to South America and they dominated for a while, then later to Australia through Antarctica as the continents move, long story short. Now this particular species, Del, um, Didelphodon vorax, is not a new species. This is known for a while, but this because they found this one particular skull of such completeness, which is hard to find in mammals because they don't, uh, because of their size, they don't do well in conditions out there. They break apart before they're ever buried and fossilized. Most of the time you find fossil mammals, it's through their teeth. Um, and, but this one is preserved enough to where not only does it give us a good idea what skull looks like, um, but also they can measure the bite force. And this, you know, I particularly like this because the bite force on this, let me see if I can find it. Um, let's see. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Because it just not only measures the bite force of the jaw, they also bite force of the canines. You can tell by the wear and tear of the teeth. Um, um, how it would actually close its mouth, and you can measure that force. Uh, let's see. But what's interesting about it is because, um, and this is a, an animal that's roughly the size of a, between a badger and a possum. So, but the jaw strength of this is such to where it could feed on, it's not insectivorous, it could feed on, um, like, um, durophagy, as it says, it was like mollusk, fish, amphibians, lizards, turtles, mammals. Um, you know, it can feed off the bones of that and or hard parts of that. So you have a much more variety of meals out of that, you know, different types of food. It had the jaw to possibly do that. Let's see. Well, let's see. An estimated maximal bite force of the canines, 218 newtons, is, gra is greater than that of most small to medium sized extent mammals, less than 15 kilograms, and only slightly less that of river otters. And, you know, and the European badgers, you know, melees, melees. Let's see, the, the, let's see, the river otter, um, 233 newtons, um, and the European badger, 244 newtons. So those two species are a little bit better than with the estimated bite force of 218. But, you know, let's see, um, in the case, pal. But it exceeds that of others. Um, let's see. It you know it has a bite force that exceeds the Tasmanian devil at 166, Thelicus, um solio, solio um, you know the marsupial lion you know which is 193 newtons, dire wolf Canis durus is 150, 157 newtons, um, African lion 116 newtons. I mean compared to those, this little guy, this early marsupial 
has got them beat as far as the bite force strength and everything. Spotted Hyena, which you know can chew bone, is only at um, oh, uh, 114 Newtons. Um, let's see. Bite force quotient greater than 100 typically occur in bone cracking specialists and taxa that occasionally hunt or scavenge on prey larger than themselves, such as the honey badger, a striped hyena, and spotted hyena. So it's interesting that, you know, that they can not only have a more complete skull than what they normally have, they can measure its bite force and, and compare it to others that are known. So that's the significance about this one. So there you go. The Jaw Yaw, the um, Meckles Cartilage Detachment, and of course uh, the bite force of this um, early marsupial. If you're interested in early mammals and you know, or just anything about paleontology, check these out. I'll link them down below. Thank you all for watching. You all have a nice day.